we want to start off with a question for you. By a show of hands, how many of you have put in time and effort into learning another language? Maybe you took a high school Spanish class, or maybe you took, bought Rosetta Stone, but you can't confidently speak that language right now. Okay. That's most of you here. Some of you are raising both of your hands. <laughs> <laughs> so we've tried learning uh, a few languages ourselves, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about what is the problem? What is the main issue that is holding everybody back from learning languages? Could it be that you're using the wrong program of study? And if you were to use the perfect program or the application, that you'd be able to learn the language. Well, here the track record isn't too good. Out of 1,000 people, 1,000 Americans who responded to the general social survey, only seven claimed they could speak another language very well and had actually learned it in school. And if you consider self-study programs like Rosetta Stone or Pimsleur, well, they can work some of the time, but they have another problem, huge dropout rates. Catherine B. Nielsen in the University of Maryland did a study that took an enthusiastic group of volunteers and found that only 6% put in more than 100 hours with the program, which is far less than what you would need using these programs to become fluent in any language. OK, well, maybe then the problem is that you don't live in the country that uses this language. And if you were to move there, you'd be able to learn it. Well, here I have to agree with you that living in the country that speaks the language definitely helps. It provides motivation and an opportunity for immersion. But it's not the answer to all of your problems. If you go to the country and you don't yet speak the language, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to rely on other expats and locals who speak English to help you get by. And that's going to create a bubble of English that's going to insulate you from immersing yourself. So we know an extreme example. We know of an American businessman who went to Korea, married a Korean woman, had children in Korea, lived in Korea for 20 years, still couldn't have a decent conversation in Korean. So living in the other country helps, but it's not a silver bullet that will answer all of your problems on its own. OK, well, finally, maybe the problem is that you're simply too old, and you should have tried learning the language as a kid, because kids learn the languages faster, right? This is actually a pervasive myth. Stephen Brown of Youngstown University and Jennifer Larson Hall of Kyushu University reviewed the literature and found that adults actually learn languages faster than children in the short run. It's only when we talk about reaching native-like levels of pronunciation and grammar where children start to show an upper hand over an adult. So definitely, if you want to just be able to communicate with people, have conversations, there's no reason you can't learn a second language at any age. OK. So if those are not the core issues, what is the core issue? We have a completely different hypothesis. And to explain this concept, I want you to look at this image of the ocean. Now, if you look at the water, you're going to see two distinct zones. The zone at the bottom, where the waves are breaking, and the zone at the top, where the waters are relatively calm. Now, I want you to imagine you're standing on the shore, and you want to swim out into the ocean. When you first start swimming out into the ocean, you're going to be in this first zone where the waves are breaking. And swimming in the zone is incredibly difficult. You feel this incredible resistance. The waves come crashing down on you, and they constantly try to push you back to the shore. However, if you were to push through this zone and get to the second zone, suddenly swimming becomes a lot easier. And more importantly, the waves aren't trying to push you back. You no longer feel this incredible resistance. So we believe that language learning works very similar to this. When you first start learning a language, you're going to be in this first zone, which we call the zone of fear or the zone of frustration, because this is where you fear using the language. This is where you fear making mistakes. This is where you fear embarrassing yourself. And learning a language in this zone is very difficult. The waves represent this negative feedback and this just constantly try to push you back to the shore. However, if you were to push past this zone and get to the second zone where the waters are calmer, suddenly language learning becomes a lot easier and a lot more fun. Mind you, I'm not saying that you're perfect when you reach the second zone, but maybe you only know a few words, but you're able to use them co confidently. Maybe you are able to have some simple conversations. And language learning goes from being always frustrating to now being rewarding most of the time. 
So the core issue we believe that a lot of the people have is that people get stuck in this zone of fear and frustration for longer than they have to. And for some people, forever. And if all you see is negative feedback, it's very hard to motivate yourself to learn further and improve yourself and learn the language that you really want to learn. So ideally, you'd use a different method, a method that allows you to get past the zone very quickly and very efficiently. So you can get to the part where language learning is fun and easy as quickly as you can. So we believe we have this method, a method that cuts through the waves and gets to the easier part of language learning as quickly and efficiently as possible. It's very simple. Don't speak in English. And that might sound a little obvious or simplistic, but it's actually really powerful. And you force yourself to speak the language you're trying to learn. And you learn words and phrases by necessity, not the order it comes up in a textbook. That means you're automatically going to learn the most frequent vocabulary and the most important words for your situation. Next, because you don't know many words and phrases, you're going to overuse what you do know. This results in an effect psychologists call overlearning, which allows you to access that information automatically. So you don't have to get tongue-tied or hesitating when you're using basic words and phrases. And finally, because you're not allowed to speak in English, you're going to easily develop conversational workarounds to handle situations that are above your level. That's going to be from learning simple phrases like, what does this mean? And how do you say this in the language relatively early on? To being able to efficiently use things like Google Translator and dictionaries to integrate new words and phrases into your conversations while you're having them. OK, so how do we know that this method works? Well, we know this method works because we've tried it for ourselves. So last year, Scott and I did an experiment where we tried to learn four different languages and we went to four different countries to learn these languages over a year. And we used this so same no English rule to learn the languages. So first we went to Spain to learn Spanish over three months. Then we went to Brazil to learn Portuguese over three months. Then over to mainland China to learn Mandarin over three months. And finally over to Korea to learn Korean over three months. And we found that this no English rule worked incredibly well. As a matter of fact, nearing the end of our travels in each country, we were confidently able to have conversations with native speakers pretty much about any subject and go about our daily lives using the language that we were trying to learn. So we actually have a short video that we'd like to show you that captures the kind of progress that we were able to make using this no English rule in just under three months for each country. So take a look. Nuestra propietario no, no tenía más español que puedo decir, ah, no hablo de inmersión más profundo. Y entonces, es, espero, espero que Brasil, 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 vale con personas de China y ellos hablan. Sé que usted va a hacer un otro video como Israel, Israel. Uh, so this might seem a little bit extreme. After all, wouldn't it be a lot easier to speak some English when you're trying to learn the language, even if it's not quite as fast as this no English rule? We actually believe that this is a misconception. And we, to argue that why it's a misconception, I'd like to reference an experience that I had. You see, years before we did this challenge, I had a different opportunity to learn a second language. I was in university, and I had the opportunity to study abroad for a year in France. And like this trip, I was very eager to learn the local language. I bought books. I downloaded podcasts. I really wanted to become fluent in French. The only difference was that I had no specific rule against speaking in English. I figured, I'll go there, and I'll speak as much English as I need to, and I'll just try to practice French whenever I can. But after a year of living in France, and pushing myself to study every single day, 
I did get to a point where I could have conversation. But it was never easy. It always felt difficult. It always felt like I was a little out of place. Now contrast that to that, my more recent experience in Spain. Once again, we have the motivation and opportunity. But this time, we have the no English rule. From the very first day we came to Spain, we decided we're only going to speak in Spanish. And as you can probably imagine, with limited Spanish skills, it was very difficult in the beginning. We had to communicate to each other almost exclusively through our dictionaries for those first few days. But after two weeks, something changed. It started to get a bit easier. After a month, even easier. And by the third month we were in Spain, it had become so easy that living our lives entirely in Spanish was automatic. We didn't have to think about studying or practicing. It was completely invisible in our lives. And what's more, after just three months in Spain, our Spanish, both of our Spanish, was much better than my French was after a year of living in France and deliberately studying. And so when you're evaluating the difficulty of a method, particularly in learning languages, it's not really fair to look at that initial sliver of difficulty. Because you have to look at how much effort you're going to be putting in, not just in the beginning, but day after day, month after month, in order to finally be able to learn this language. And what we found is not even just that the no English rule is faster, but then when you take it over this longer view, it's actually easier than any other method we've tried for learning a language. And I'd like to speak about another misconception that a lot of people have is that you'd somehow be able to completely avoid making mistakes when you first start learning a language. And that's simply not true. Actually, making mistakes is very good because it means you're using the language. And it eventually helps you gain the confidence that you need to speak the language. When Scott and I were doing this challenge, we made mistakes every day, especially in the beginning. Everything we said was wrong, but that's OK. And in China and in Korea, because Chinese and Korean are so much harder than the European languages we attempted to learn, we often, we, we, we slipped up and broke the no English rule a couple times as well. But it didn't matter, because it's not about making mistakes, how many mistakes you're making. It's more about that each time you make a mistake, you try again. So remember, the whole goal of this process and this method is to push past that zone of frustration and fear so you can get to the part where language learning becomes fun and easy. Ideally, the way you would do this is you would move to the country that speaks this language <laughs> and go 100% immersion from the first day and commit to the no English rule. But obviously, that's a bit extreme. And a lot of you here might not have the opportunity to do that. But I'd like to point out that the beauty of the no English rule is that it doesn't have to be 100% no English all the time with everybody. It can also work in a limited context. So let me give you an example. If you are trying to learn Spanish, and you have a coworker or colleague that speaks Spanish, maybe you commit to the no English rule every time you see this person. So every time you're going to see them, you only commit to speaking in Spanish. So if you were to bump into them at the water cooler and you want to make small talk, and you want to say, let's say you were busy at work, and you want to say, oh, I'm so busy today. It's OK to pull out your dictionary and translate the entire sentence. You don't have to feel ready to say this. The goal is to just try and attempt. And what this really helps you do is it helps you out with two very important things. The first one, it helps you remove the ambiguity of which language should you use. Because if with this coworker, let's say you can speak in Spanish and you can speak in English, obviously you're going to default to speaking in English because it's so much easier. But by committing to the no English rule, you're saying, every time I see this person, I know it's practice time. There's no doubt in my mind that now I have to speak Spanish, even if I have to pull out my dictionary. And the second thing it helps you out with is it helps you develop a habit of speaking the language even at a very low level of ability. This really helps you out build the confidence that you eventually are going to need when you start speaking this language to a higher level of ability. So you've heard about our challenge. Now we'd like to issue you one. And no, we're not asking you to sell all your stuff and go live in a faraway country. We're going to ask you to do something a lot simpler. But if you follow through on it, it will still be very effective if you want to finally start having conversations in that language that you've been learning for all your life. It's just three steps. Step one, find one person. It could be a native speaker of this language, 
or it could be another language learner. It could be someone that you already know, a friend, a colleague, a spouse, or it could be someone that you find online. There's services at italkai.com and Live Mocha to find conversation partners online. So if you can't find this person in your life right now, there's easy tools for finding them online. Step two, commit to the no English rule with this person. Every time you see them, just speak in this language that you're trying to learn. Tell them that you know, even though you're not too great at the language yet, you're going to have to use Google Translator and Dictionary a lot in the beginning. That's okay. Step three, start speaking. Once again, it's not something that you have to be perfect at. You might slip up and break the no English rule. Just try again. Pull out your phone, download the Google Translator app, and you can type in whole sentences if you don't feel comfortable yet speaking the language. The goal is to get you to start speaking, to start building that knowledge of the words, and start practicing those core phrases. What we're hoping is that by showing you this method, we're encouraging you to get started with something, not to be perfect. And maybe even today to decide that, find that one person and start this rule and finally start speaking that language. The Chinese have an expression, which means a good start is half of success.